I live in Jerusalem since 1972. On this journey, there have been other Jerusalem journeys prior to that. And uh, I was born Pesach, but during a period of time in the United States, a uh, public school teacher who I had only for about three months uh, before we, my parents discovered the world of the yeshiva for us, uh, I was all of eight years old at the time, suggested that Pisach won't do for the American melting pot. And at that time, uh, parents were in awe of teachers. So they didn't tell them to fly a kite. And it was Tish above in our house. And so we looked for an Anglicized name. And uh, we had the last word. I happened to be a firstborn. And uh, a firstborn in the book of Exodus is Peto Rechem. So Pesach became Peter without blinking an eyelash. It remained as true to a Jewish term as ever, except they never knew it. So I grew up, anybody who calls me Pete, I know it was from the Lower East Side. That's the period of time. Pete stuck even when Pesach returned. Mm -hmm. I was born in Munich, Germany, from Eastern European Hasidic extract. My grandparents came to the... Um, to Munich, of all places, from Galicia, Galicia, from a little town called Tachin, uh, at the turn of the century, for reasons of Parnassa, earning a living. And uh, they had a little grocery store in Munich, and that's where my father was born as well. He was the youngest of the children, had seven children, and uh, I'm from my father, Alex, who was Alexander Moshe, who was born in, in, in Munich. And I was born there as well in 1931. That's two years prior to Hitler's rise to power. So that gives you a political framework. Here you're looking at a Jewish child who grew up in Nazi Germany. Uh, the story has been documented by the Spielberg people, how it was such a rare thing that my parents arrived in New York City prior to their children. Uh, I'm not sure if you're interested in that story, but it is a, it is, is a part of a tragic history of that period in any case. Uh, my, we had a family business in uh, Munich, uh, which was, besides the grocery store, it, it, it evolved into a, a mail-order house. And so it grew into something larger than a little grocery store. And the Nazi party people were looking for cash flow at the time. It's a known story. And so they went to the owners of these uh, enterprises, and they, were gonna, and they did send them to two early concentration camps. They didn't call them concentration camps at the time, holding operations. One was Sachsenhausen, one was Dachau, and my father was on a list to be sent to Dachau, which is right next to Munich. How did he know about it? Because one of our employees was a member of the Nazi party, and they saw his name on the list. So he had a split loyalty. The Schindler family gave his family business and putting food on the table, and yet he was a staunch member of the Nazi party. My father and his sister-in-law, Sally Schindler, my aunt, who she was also part of the business, she's the mother of Rabbi Alexander Schindler, who later became the head of the reform movement, snuck out that night, smuggled out of Germany that night, and visited the Belzer Rebbe on the way out to Poland to get his blessings. We were come from Belza Hasidim uh, background. And my father went to Italy, waited about seven months in Milano to get a, a um, precious visa to come in to the United States. We had cousins living, the Clarissenfelds living in New York, sent them a visa. So my father gets to the United States, 
in the summer of 1938, August 1938, leaves his wife and two little children in Munich. Now, in the interim, history doesn't stop. My father tries to get them over. In the meantime, Kristallnacht takes place November 9th and 10th, 1938. And I remember the event very clearly because we went to school that day. We were not permitted. Jewish children, according to the Nuremberg logs, were no longer going to German public schools. And it's better that way because Jewish children were publicly insulted in classrooms if the teacher happened to be sympathetic to the Nazi party. You see pictures of those incidents at Yad Vashem all the time. They made him go up to the board and say, Ich bin ein Jude. I'm a dirty Jew in front of a class. Imagine what this does to children. We were saved from that, so we went to a Jewish school. That Jewish school, which people like Martin Buber and Professor um, Ernest Simon were very much part of creating a Jewish adult education protective device to keep the sanity of Jews during that terrible period. They thought originally when Hitler came to power in 1933 with responsibility uh, there would be some level of political seriousness in his part. But it got worse and in all of his speeches and I had the privilege of hearing him in Munich uh, it was di not difficult to hear him because he shouted his speeches of what he thought about Jews. In any case, um, our school was burnt down that day, and uh, that Kristallnacht put a fear into what whoever Jews were still there. My mother panics, of course, goes to the American consulate in Stuttgart, and try to recreate that scene, dressed us up. I was eight. My small brother was seven, six and a half. And she has maybe six, seven minutes to speak to the American consul. And everybody knew what we wanted. So he looks through the papers and he says, Mr. Schindler, Frau Schindler, you can have a visa immediately. You happen to be a Polish citizen, which he was. She was born in Poland, and they had a quota system of refugees who could get out with a Polish citizenship. But the two children, I'm afraid, we cannot give an entry visa because they don't have any citizenship. What do you mean by that? Well, the Nuremberg Laws, children who were born, Jewish children born in Germany after World War I, were Staatslos, had no citizenship. And therefore, we don't have a visa for now. Now, I, I never spoke to her about that moment. It was a devastating moment. But that kind of scene repeated itself thousands of times of the victim being in a position, of being in a dilemma to make the decision for whatever is going to happen to them. And how could she leave two children? What are we supposed to do? And we were, so my mother began crying. Now these minutes... He was beginning impatient. He began shuffling his book. He says, what we suggest is, you leave, get your visa out immediately. As soon as you arrive in U.S. territorial waters, send us a, um, a telegram. And there we have a clause that when both parents are in the United States, legally so, we can reunite the family and then send you out. Now this is very draconian. I mean, first of all, there were other consuls who didn't work that way. These were the Ron Wall the, the Raul Wallenrods. These were the people, the Japanese consul in 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 uh, uh, in Lita, who were writing out false passports and who died a pauper incidentally. It's completely forgotten by history. The Hebrew University has picked them up a little bit. And my mother made the decision to go, put us in an orphanage, Jewish orphanage, uh, 140 Jewish children with similar stories. And my brother and I and two other children, two brothers, whose mother was Jewish and whose father was Christian, gave them the luxury of being sent to Theresienstadt. We were taken out 
in the middle of the night on February 20, in the beginning of February of 1940. The war is already on since September the 1st, 1939. And we were smuggled out, we were dressed up in Tiroler Hosen, the ethnic uh, garments of children living in Bavaria. And I, blue eyes are still with me, I had blonde hair, so that my brother, we were put on a train to the Dutch border. That train was really a military train bringing soldiers to, to Holland, German soldiers, in preparation for the spring inva invasion of Belgium and Holland. And we were my mascots to them because we had signs we were going to visit our uncle and aunt in Rotterdam. Well, that decision of my mother saved our lives because mothers who did not make that decision remained there. Out of the 140 children, incidentally, only four children survived. All the others were sent to Kovna, put up in front of a um, machine guns and murdered, including some of my school my school uh, mates at the time. One of whom was Kupfer, who, who together with him I was arrested as an eight-year-old tearing down anti-Semitic posters in Munich. What's your earliest memory of faith or of God? I would say it was environmental rather than philosophical. Uh, we grew up, we, d we did not come into, we were not parachuted or parachuted ourselves late into um, Judaism in its intimate way. To us it was a very, it was a very intimate part of our growing up. That means we were a home that observed mitzvot. And so God meant for us the source of those mitzvot. And we were not mature enough as yet to be able to see it as an attempt to enrich our lives or to play a mission in tikkun olam, the broader things uh, come much later in life, if they come at all. Uh, but I would say, you know, when you read Heschel's memories of Warsaw, these were memories for us. These were, this was a, 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 an experience in memory. And these were very positive experiences, as we were fortunate to grow up in a home that was not suffocating, didn't, we were not it was not jammed down our our hesitant uh, young lives uh, where one part of it says, you know, now let's go out and play football. We'll take religion whenever we can fit it in. It was total, and and it was it was less um, vertical. It was horizontal. By that I mean that. The weeks and the days and months of the year contained these, I will call them traffic signs, and they were expected because you always looked forward to Hanukkah before it came, and you, Pesach was in the year uh, before Purim came in, and so these, the environment was three-dimensional, and it was not questioned, and it was part of a good family, a, a solid family upbringing. And I feel very fortunate to have been part of that thing. Now, you, you, we're sitting here 100 meters from a community of young people that you see out there. The great majority of them do not have the kind of thing I'm just describing. They either are part of a late entry into Judaism, and I tell them something different. I say, I admire where you are now. And I mean it. I'm not just telling them something that is, that is 
in order to make them feel good. I did not have what you have. In other words, you are getting a fresh look, albeit you feel inadequate and you feel ignorant about it and you're starting it at the ground floor or on the first floor and we our yeshiva is now 14 years old but i've been with these students you were among those students many of them at the hebrew university is their first contact with any kind of serious experience in judaism we're now getting more day school kids and yeshiva kids and and uh, you have to deal with them in a different way. They have other problems. So I say, I admire you. You're coming in with a tabla rasa. Fresh. There's this thing. But when you ask me this kind of a question, I'm saying I feel grateful that my parents sustained that. When they came to the United States, their experience in Europe, which was a, a harrowing experience, it was by the breath of a hair that it could have gone in the other direction. Sustained it, and they sent us to yeshiva, to Eastern European yeshiva, the Shlomo Kluger yeshiva on the Lower East Side, which was peppered and salted with another kind of calendar that paralleled the Jewish calendar, and that was... We had a punch ball season and a stick ball season and a basketball season. And these were part of our uh, Lower East Side Park environment that did not in any way compete with the yeshiva on Houston Street across the way. And, uh, and that was a positive thing. And so we were able to maintain a, a split radar kind of thing which did not compete with one another, but in a healthy way integrated with one another. So I could recite for you the entire New York Giants baseball team of 1943. Mel Ott in left field, Rucker in center field, Medwick, who was a Dodger trader, moving over to the Giants in left field. Bartell on third base, Ruck, uh Jurgis on shortstop, Whittick on second base, and Johnny Mize on first base, and Danning as a catcher, and Carl Hubble, if you want to remember these names. Oh, you do. Right. I think you ought to interview him for your baseball people. They ought to get it. They ought to get a hearing. And right now I'm reading a book that a friend gave me, the greatest game ever played. Do you know who that was? The football New York Giants against the, uh, the uh, uh, Baltimore Colts with Johnny Unitas against Johnny, Charles Connolly. And it is a brilliant description of each of these players, what was going on in their lives. And that was considered to be one of the greatest ever athletic competitions that ever took place. Mine had a different one, was Bobby Thompson reading hitting a homer off Branca and beating out the Brooklyn Dodgers after 13 and a half games behind on July the 4th. So, that's it. That's my... In what year? That, I believe, was 19... Help me here, Arnie. I don't know, 52? 50, 52 or 3. Yeah, right. Yes. Shot. It was a shot that was heard around the world. Yes, Bobby Thompson. Yes. Is there a specific, uh, you talked about it being, uh, faith being environmental. Was there a specific memory you have, a specific event? I mean, was it something around Shabbos or Chagim or, or is it something about the home or about Beit Knesset or study? Uh, like you have the, the earliest memory you have about being part of this Jewish environment. It could have been in Europe. Uh, There's so many, you know, to... Uh, you would have to really give me time, then it would spoil the answer. Because he wanted something that is off the cuff. I would say these were figures, uh, rather than a particular uh, kind of thing that crossed my path. You talk about teachers that have crossed your path. 
I would say a Torah Vedas, which is my high school yeshiva experience, I encountered a young, tall Talmud teacher of mine. He was called Rabbi Kahana, except we called him Kahana Jr. because his father, who was an elderly gentleman, was called Kahana Sr. and I had them both um, as teachers. And that person uh, left space in his in his mind to allow the student to come in. And uh, my other love at the time, which was just percolating because it was at first forced down upon me, and this is in the field of music. And uh, uh, it has been my whole life. Eventually I majored in musicology at, at Columbia, but uh, I'm a Vietnamese violinist and the violist and I played with the Hebrew University Orchestra and he knew that and I was the I was the concert master of the Torah Vedas Symphony Orchestra which consisted of my geometry teacher who was playing this heretical saxophone how do you get a saxophone into a symphony orchestra and uh, uh, I got an A out of geometry for that <laughs> And there was a clarinetist uh, who was who was Mizayefin. He was as Mizayef. He played off too, part of the time. Yes, faking. And we had our history teacher who was the pianist, and the young kid who was also a pianist. That was it. And so he knew about my interest in music, and he somehow became interested in music through Leonard Bernstein because Leonard Bernstein to him represented a fellow who refused to change his Jewish name. You're probably familiar with that. His, his um, teacher or his mentor, uh, Serge Krasovitsky, who was the conductor of the Boston um, Symphony Orchestra, uh, whom he considered as his father image. His real father was also emerged as a, as a kind of a Talmud Chacham who learned something about Talmud. So Bernstein, who was the first subscriber to the El Am Talmud of the United Synagogue, they made a big deal out of it, and Bernstein studied Talmud from that, that thing, and he heard about that, and he became interested in Bernstein's music. So after class, he calls me over one day, and he says, I want you to tell, tell me something. I bought a record. They, we were still on 78 RPMs at the time, of the Jeremiah Symphony. Uh, that was an attempt by Bernstein to take Eicha, Lamentations, and to put it into music through the Tisha B'Av experience. And he took me out of the yeshiva thing, environment, because for him I looked to opening up my pages of Talmud. Now he's discussing something else. That kind of synthesis was remarkable for me because in life, without spelling it out, he represented Chochmah, wisdom in the largest sense as Rambam, my mom has understood it, and as a source of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Namely that, that here a, a oddball, Bernstein before he became establishment, it was very oddball in many ways. Not only in the gender thing that he, everybody knew about, but he, he was a tormented soul in many ways. At, at the end of his life, too bad he smoked himself to death. I mean, it's, the other day would have been his 90th birthday. Would you imagine where we would have gone? Just, just four days ago. Represented to Kahana... Junior, a, a, a divine entity. Now, in Hasidut, we believe that every human being has that. Except when you're that young, you don't think of it in those terms. Now it begins to fit in. So that, that every person, this is one of the most optimistic things in my more mature Judaic 
development that when we go through the crises in life, and everybody has them, you had it in your life already, and they're lonely, they're lonely days. They're days that you don't know why you want to continue with it, right? Here, this love affair is now it's, it's destroyed. Where do I go from here? And I have close friends who've gone through that experience that there is an element in my tape or my heritage of Yahadut which says, how dare you get up in the morning and not get out of bed? That God gives you another day to, to breathe and to participate in something that is beautiful. How dare you throw it away? How dare you close the door? How dare you pull down the window shade? Right? That's it. So he, and then I'm, I'm giving this to me almost as it's new, because I never really saw him that way, but he is that way. Those kind of people spoke to me. And so that is a memory that I would like to share with you. I hope he's alive somewhere. I don't know where he is today. He's only a few years older than I am. What is your concept of God in Karish Baruch Well, there are different, because I have a, a kind of a heretical, almost blasphemous, uh, pantheistic view, that if God, let's go back to, to basics, if God exists, and he's got to exist on my terms. And those terms are the all of it. Everything. And so there are moments when God is one that I address my disappointments to, there are times that I address my gratitudes to, that I address guilt feelings to. He becomes an all collective things and like a divine salamander who changes colors, he has to be there in a very intimate way for me to talk. Otherwise, I'd be talking to the wall, and I'm not that pantheistic. I'm not that theistic to, to credit divine things in stones and, and, and wood, even though there are implications for that in life as well. The, the terrible scene of the first murder in, in civilization, biblical civilization, is demei achicha tzoakim. This is the plural. The bloods of your brother are calling out. You know, what do you mean, am I my brother's keeper? That's the chutzpah of Cain. If he would have said, I'm sorry, I didn't know that if you take a rock or if you, and then put it, throw it at him, that he's going to go to sleep and never wake up again, he could have had that argument. So it was the first murder. I, it was a, a, a halachic response of onus, of of uh, forced forced response. You know it. But what does he say? He lies through his teeth, and he says, "What's my connection with him?" So that's one brother. But then, when God responds, listen to this. You can't get credit for this point anymore. You're not in my class but you can get a, a larger credit for it. The me achicha, the bloods, the plural form. Why the plural form? There's this brilliant midrash in the Mishnah that the stones and the, and the trees, the wood, upon which this blood is spilled, they are still witnesses to this thing. So there is a sense of divinity in this, that God is around as what's there, and he's there around as well. So that's the kind of God I have. I have problems with that God, because, I, you see, it's not only the Shoah, uh, and I have to do this very frequently when I lecture at Yad Vashem, and I pull out the usual... It's almost flippant response that God 
pays pay the price for giving us, or humanity pays the price for giving human human beings freedom of choice. And once he gave us that, he stays out of it. He's not going to pull the chestnuts out of a fire like he did once in a lifetime in history. When I was at the Exodus of Egypt, we say at the Seder table, "Lo adidei malach, lo bebe." He entered history and reacted in history. But elsewhere, we make our bed in history, and the Jewish people make our bed, made its bed in history. And the conclusion that I've come is that if God has sent us a message, it is that we have not appreciated our. We have not been enough historically proactive as Jews, and we have capitulated to Galut without a fight, and we have paid a tremendous price for that. Now, this does not in any way arouse questions such as, "Do you mean to say, as a result of that?" The Nazi was God's agent for teaching us a lesson of what happened. No, not at all. One has nothing to do with the other. In the state of Israel, three and a half years after the Shoah, was the only response we could have taken. And if we stepped on somebody's toes, I feel sorry for that. Who are we? Who are we? Who, what right do we have to say we are entering, re-entering history? At the expense of another people who have been here before, I will not say it before the camera. If I was on the Lower East Side, I would have another expression for that. Right now, Adam Karov Asmo. Jewish people have to finally assert itself, and it karmi lo natati. We've been on everybody else's bandwagon, and if you look at people who are most active for Darfur. That's the Jews, the largest African community of refugees, are here. We don't talk about them; they're here. Students of ours at the Hebrew University go visit them every Friday. We don't make a big deal out of them. The Egyptians are shooting them down as they're trying to get in. To to uh, nobody says a word. The Muslim world that is very much responsible for the tragedy of Darfur are not at all involved. And and. So I have this, the, the God that you're asking me to do, I think has sent us some, some painful messages. That it's time that we woke up, and time is not, a, is not for us. Because we have contributed a statistic that we have among the lowest birth rates in the world. And the only, and I have my arguments with the Haredi world, on many cases, but they are reproducing at a time that is countering the 1.1 reproductive statistic of Jews living living in the Galut. So the question isn't there's a silent God who's sending me loud messages. Do you feel like God has ever intervened in your life? Way to ask it's a gamble. Yes, it happened two weeks ago. I was sitting at a desk similar to this, and that's where my computer is. And at every day at ten o'clock, like a compulsive yucca that I am, I look at my computers to shut down the day. I used to shut down the day with Kriyat Shema. Now I shut down the day with computers, and I prefer the first one, this one. On that day, I was very tired, and I was not sitting at that desk. And I'm upstairs. We have a home in Givat Masu on the second floor, and Shlomit and I. Shlomit is my wife, in case you're asking, and uh, we hear a crash. And I thought there were two cars outside who crashed into one another 
We went outside to see what happened, nothing there. So we begin searching in the house. We come down to every room. The last room was that room that I always sit in. What was happening was books on my bookshelf on top, parts of the Shulchan Aruch, somehow incredibly moved a heavy menorah, Hanukkah menorah that is sitting next to it, and it's been there for a long time, sits up there between Hanukkahs, goes up there. And evidently, how these, how these Shulchan Aruch moved the thing, it was like a, a Rube Goldberg reaction, the, the, we came in the scene was horrific. It broke through the glass um, chandelier over my, my uh, desk, and where my head is usually, that's where the Hanukkah menorah, a heavy one, fell. It could have been my head. And glass all over, just the thing. It, it missed the computer, which would have been a worse tragedy than my head. And, and there it is. And we said to ourselves, Baal Hanisi may no makir at Niso. That there are miracles happening all the time, and we don't know it. And it could have been quite serious. That Shabbos I said, Birkat HaGomel on the Beit Knesset. So, I say that, first of all, this is, this is a gamble. Why shouldn't I say this was God's act? Let's say it wasn't. Does it bother God if I say it does? So if I say it, and if it was a miraculous thing, there must have been some kind of a hand, some kind of a force, that on that day, which I'm never there before, I do so. I'm, I wasn't there. But there was another aspect to it, because you're now pushing me to the supernatural. Because you're really after that, aren't you? Some kind of a mystical thing. Our daughter Chaya, who is much more spiritual than I am, had just come back from her Hasidic experience in, uh, via a quasi Bratzlava group that took um, 120 people on the Hasidic experience. This included Zhitomir and Berdichev and Mezibuz and Uman, of course, and they spent five days there. While they were in Mizabus, there is a legend there that the well from which the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh drank, if you pay the cab driver, uh, the Goyish cab driver, a few dollars, two dollars, he'll take you in his taxi down, it's a 15 minute ride, he knows where it is, and all those people who were into the spiritual thing was a marvelous experience. You're familiar with the Balcento? They go down there, they take their bottles and fill it up with that water. And Chaya tells me, this is my daughter, Dad, every day I want you to drink a little bit. She brought this as my gift. I expected to see a t-shirt and I got this <laughs> bottle of Balcento water. And I, that morning I drank a little bit. It was in that refrigerator right over there. And I said to myself, this is either God or his agent, the Balchantov, that saved my life, that saved my head at least, from, from this sort of thing. Now, this sounds a little flippant, but strip away the flippancy and you'll get something quite serious. There are things happening in our life that we have no answer to, how two children get plucked out of Nazi Germany while millions of others don't go that way. Now I have to be very, very careful because that cannot ever be interpreted. Do I? This means that we're, are we better off, more privileged? Is, is there such a thing as lady luck? Frank Sinatra saw, right? And, but there is something that our human limits, lo machshavatai machshavateichem, says Isaiah, and that's true. We don't, we don't see everything. You're interviewing all these people, you're getting a fraction of what, you're, what, what these people are. 
and what's going on around them. And that, if you want to put a label, this is a divine experience. I'll buy into that. There's something beyond me for which I have no... And I say I have a problem with it because if I'm grateful for that, I have to explain why that divine experience did not accompany others who were better than I am, lived Jewish lives, religious lives better than I am. I'll have to live with that paradox always. But in the meantime, you've got to make a little bit, go that extra mile while you're living to at least say, if I had this chance, I better do something with it. Do you feel like there's been a particular time in your life that you really struggled with faith? Sure. We lost a child. A beautiful 28-year-old daughter. Excuse me, yes? 38. But she was 38 years old. Left for young children, and it wasn't an accident, it was cancer, breast cancer. So, you, you, you don't have too much, you know, if you can't be angry about it, it was not like somebody else's fault, it wasn't a car accident, or it wasn't somebody who, God forbid, raped her or did something like that, no, it was ordinary breast cancer, the, the testicles. Well, I don't, wouldn't, I, I don't know if I would say anger, I would say question, why? Why? Every parent would say, <laughs> at that stage of the game, I have lived, I've lived more for my life to be able to say, I will give her whatever was due to me and let her live her full life. So, and it gets worse with the years. You shouldn't ever feel um, loss of that kind in your life. And people tastelessly will say, you know, with time, they mean well, with time things will settle down. Now look, you hear me joking, and I use humor as much as possible in teaching, and uh, uh, it's a Pagliacci cover. You know, it's, you like opera? You know what Pagliacci is. It's, but you can't be bitter about it, because Gita would not have wanted us to do that. And in the process, if you overbalance this question that you're asking, then you... You go to a cemetery, stand over a grave, and put put a bullet in your in your in your head. Which there are people who do that. There are people who grieve so much that they they kill themselves in the process. Anger is a form of killing yourself too. It is a form of spiritual suicide because you can't make proper decisions when you're angry. Do you have a being a teacher, it's going to be interesting to see how you answer this. Do you have a, a, a pasuk or a tefillah that is most important to you? Something that really... Oh, sure. What is it? I say it every morning on my morning jog. I got up at 4.30 and uh, after Modeani, which is obvious, I say the Asher Yatsar Eta Adam Bechokhmah. I thank God for creating human beings with wisdom that were the one moment she imi patach echad mehem he built me with a plumbing system the kavim the kavim chalalim chalalim galui biyadua the fanecha she imi sagar echad mehem or put she imi patach echad mehem or isagar echad mehem lo chalamod la fanecha filu sha echad and these these this remarkable system that we are in. 
and it is so existentially online, online, not offline. And that, if, and it's interesting medically. If I happen to be a medic too from the army days, that if a if a artery closes down on you, you have more time to live than if it erupts on you. If you have a major burst, an aneurysm, you don't have much chance in it in the critical areas to live. So the Asha Yatsa says if any of them open up and then comes and if any of them close up, you cannot live. And so we're living in a in a this remarkable machine that we have that also has a remarkable soul. I'm able to talk to you, you're able to talk to me, and we're living on a very kind of quasi-sophisticated plane with subtleties and philosophies that a plant, to my knowledge, cannot do. And that my cat that comes in the morning to get her tuna fish sandwich from me, I make three sandwiches, two for myself, one for the cat. And they don't, they're not able to do that. And so it is a wonder that in this, in this, and what is it? It's a piece of paper. There is paper stronger than my skin, right? That holds a very complicated hematological system. That any of these things can go wrong. Any of the infinite aspects of this thing can go wrong. And it works for you day and night while I'm conscious and while I'm not conscious. To me, that, to be able to say, this is an accident, this operates by itself. I know I'm going back to things of Rambam and Aquinas and things like that, but because we've been, it was taught to us in philosophy one at Brooklyn College, therefore I have a kind of a disdain. You had to write an exam on it too. That's the worst thing. I think Woody Allen had it right. He was thrown out of NYU. The only course he passed there was a course in existential philosophy because on every question on his exam he wrote, I don't know, which is exactly what existential philosophy is. So that class he passed. <laughs> but but so seriously, this is what you're talking about. We're standing, we're thinking, we're feeling, and soul is neshama, right? Uh, so, so that that is, and as you get older, <coughs> the thing you're sorry about that you neglected it in the early days. George Bernard Shaw was absolutely correct. Uh, youth is wasted on the young. We have all of these abilities to to go get them, and we don't have the maturity to do it and to know why you're doing it. Kids who were ahead of us on that score, we, they were considered nutcases. You know, people who went, who were already at, at the age of 14 or 15 or 16 knew they were going to be uh, lawyers and doctors and so on. We didn't know that. We just wanted to go out and play the next game at that time. Now as age goes and time runs quicker, Einstein was absolutely correct in it. From a different perspective, he proved it on a on a blackboard. Time is very relative. Time is not running at the same speed for us at my age, and it's running for you, and then it ran for you 20 years ago. That's why some people at our age become they're not laughing as much, not smiling as much. They're introspective to such an extent that it paralyzes them. And so they retire early and sleep till 10 o'clock and they give up on that because it's so frightening to know that you've turned over the other side of the record. You know, we only have less than half a record to play and the next day less on that and less on that and less on that. And the rare bird who for genetic reasons is able to move into past his 70s into his 80s, to 80s into the 90s, if they're lucky enough to have quality of life with it. So 
Arnie knows that. They're Tzedakah Project support. These, the world of geriatrics. And I'm not now quite sure what answer I'm responding to, but I think if I can reconnect that, that if a Kurdish Baruch who gives me these modules to be able to, to learn a little bit. Right now, what's given me new adrenaline is that I'm on a, going back to frontline research. I'm going to back off a bit on teaching, and I hope to be in Poland, in Galicia, uh, this coming late spring or early summer to uh, research the historic, to be the historic quest of Rabbi Moshe Sofer, Rabbi Moshe Pshevorsk, a hidden tzaddik who lived from 1720 to 1805, if you can imagine, in Pshevorsk, a shtetl in Galicia, who they, they discovered his manuscripts, which became the classic Or Pnei Moshe, a commentary on the five books of Moses, working through the 16th century Moshe Alchich. He believed he, that he was speaking to him across the centuries. And he was the Baal Shem Tov's type of tzaddik, a hidden tzaddik. Nobody knew. He was a scribe. He wrote Tfilin and Mezuzot, and all the Hasidic greats of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century got their Tfilin and Mezuzot and the Sifrei Torah to him. But they discovered his manuscript after he died, and it became a classic. Now, when you study these saints, it's a hierarchy. It's a kind of the Haggadot, the legends, outnumber the historic realities. Now, I wrote to the Polish archives in the Shtetlach, and lo and behold, there are files on Przeworsk from the period that he lived, all this period of time, of Jews and Jewish life in Przeworsk. And it's going to be in Polish, it is in Polish. I'll have to get a graduate student from Poland, majoring in Jewish studies, and I hope to look at these things and see whether this Rabbi Moshe of Przeworsk actually, was he that hidden that nobody knew about him? That he wasn't involved in the community? There were pogroms going on in his time. In 1734, 1744, there were protests, there was there were good relationships with their non-Jewish um, uh, community people in Shavros. There were poor ones, a lot of within Judaism and Jewish community, positive and negative politics. Where is this Rabbi Moshe? Is he silent or is he, is he there? Is, does he appear in their birth records? Does he appear in their death records? These kind of things. So I look forward to working with this with this fella as soon as I can get some some uh, research grants. Maybe Procter and Gamble has some kind of a special special research grants because I need money to go there, to live there, to travel there, and then to hire my people to photograph these things and to and to, and to analyze them. And so it's an exciting thing. It gives you an adrenaline like like a spaceship that you give it a shot, and it gets another space in. So that's where I'm headed to, uh, if God is good to me and gives, gives me the health. So, to go back to my roots. And if you're interested, why did you choose this guy? It goes back to the beginning of our story. My maternal, my paternal grandmother from my father's maternal side is a direct descendant of the Orphanay Moshe. What are you most grateful for? What's your greatest wish? And do you have a message for people who will see your portrait around the world? Let's begin with the last one. The message I would say is, you've got more than you haven't got, and appreciate that. People, you know, there's a story <coughs> of, of a a Jew who's running around in a shtetl and he's running. They're always running. They're, they're hyper. Have you seen them? They're never still in any way. So the Menachem Mendel of, of Kotsk 
asking him, you understand a little Yiddish? Can I throw a little Yiddish? We like that. We like that. Where are you running to? So he says, I forgot something. So he says, why are you going there? Maybe what you lost is in the back of you. That's a very poignant thing. But people in their lives, even unwittingly, have gotten so much out of life that they're looking for to upgrade themselves, which is a very positive thing. Forget what they have accomplished and what they have. So they will, for instance, forget their family. I mean, they're now into something else. They're... they're, they're family in every way. They will forget the books they should be rereading that gave them pleasure 20 years ago, but it's a different book, right? And it is to re-enjoy the moments as, as history. That's what really history is from a Jewish point of view. It isn't merely a recollection of dates in a diary. It's to relive that and appreciate that. The, the, the other question you ask, what are you grateful for? I'm grateful to be able to talk to you here. And uh, that is not to be taken for granted. Um, people who don't no longer have that ability, who never had that ability. And then to to work with it, to work with that ability to to namely to give it an existential realism, not merely as an empty kind of statement. I'm grateful that I'm alive. A lot of people say that. I'm grateful I can get up in the morning. But the follow-up question to that is, what are you doing this to make that kind of a thing realistic? This morning, I'm teaching here already since 1973. So a brainstorm, because I we're starting a new class today. What I want to give these people that 30, 40 people sitting there studying Talmud that we didn't do last year. If we're rerunning last year's classes with a different text, I don't feel good about it. But let me give you something. I'm going to reproduce for you a more advanced text in the English Art Scroll, which we haven't used. But on one condition, that what we have done in this last hour and a half that during the week it doesn't go blank and I see you again next week starting from now. No, I want you to be able to take what you have experienced and to, ev to work with it so that the past is there but it doesn't become a brand new thing next week as if nothing happened during these six days. What I'm trying to say is that the time that you have is to work with what you have and to build on a kind of a thing like that, and to have that opportunity to even get that kind of thing in your head is, first of all, the ultimate of optimism. It is a form of where in Chodesh Elul, this is the month of Elul, where we, we should be doing that according to Jewish tradition every day, to count the pluses and minuses of our daily, of our daily work. But God has been good to us. He only gives us two months to do that in. The rest of the time, we can work with other things. So tshuva is this sort of thing. Uh, tshuva, I'm not saying anything original, originally is the epitome of a theology of optimism and hope. But again, the theology is up there. God doesn't need hope. God doesn't need uh, optimism. God is, is, is tensed up that they're looking at our, how we behave down here. And people who move through time, I have no time. I, I, get, I get very impatient with those people. I try to be diplomatic because those people don't know it, you know, that they're not using time to the ultimate. On that hopeful note. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.